Hello and welcome to episode 11 of the Frame and Sequence podcast. In this episode, I chat with New York City-based photographer David Zhang. David is a New York City native, and after eight years working in finance, he decided to leave his career to pursue a career in photography. Shooting mostly black and white film and being largely self-taught, he sought further education at the International Center of Photography, where he studied under a master darkroom printer. In 2018, he traveled to China to photograph his first series, which he then self-published as his first book, titled Reveries. I first discovered David's work on Instagram a few years ago and was instantly taken with it and, of course, went down the rabbit hole. I will link to his website and to his book Reveries in the show notes, which I highly recommend checking out and spending some time on. David shares some great insights into his process and thinking in this episode, and I hope you enjoy. Well, thanks, David. I appreciate you doing this with me. I'm happy to do this. Welcome it, to the Brooklyn Navy Arts. Thank you so much. It's a, it's awesome to be here in your studio and uh, be surrounded by your, your photography that I've only ever seen online. So it's a, a thrill to see it in person. I'm so excited to just dive in and ask you some questions. Thank you. How did you originally get started in photography? Well, my my journey started maybe a little bit more than three years ago. Previously, I was in finance. I worked in finance for eight years. Oh, wow. Yeah very long eight years <laughs> but you know i've always thought i had a creative side to me then finance thing was like you know it wasn't like i was bad at my job i think i was pretty good at my job it's just something that i didn't feel like i could do for the rest of my life photography i guess it wasn't something I, I, it's not like a very romantic story i kind of just got into it because my friends were already doing it and funny enough actually um instagram made me want to go out and explore photography because of all the creative things that were happening on Instagram at that time. So me and my friend, actually my good friend Daniel, we'll, we'll see some like really cool Instagram post or some picture of like a scene in New York and we were like, oh, that's really cool. Let's go out and like copy it. Right. <laughs> you know, like go back to the same exact spot or find that exact same location, same composition, you know, uh, you know, maybe even like throw a little bit of our twist to it, but we'll, we'll try to do that. But that's my introduction to uh, photography. Since then, I've been dabbling with so many aspects of it and I think I've found something that I really love. Your work seems like a far cry from those early days of copying just the the run of the middle <laughs> New York <laughs> shots. You. <laughs> did you did you have any formal training then, or any mentors that? Uh, I, did, I I did not go to school, as far as formal training. I did attend uh, the International Center of Photography mm -hmm. for a course in the dark room, but that was really more of and I already had my dark room. And that was really more for me to kind of see what's going on and how people are working in their own way. So I made sure I, you know, I, I signed up to a course who the professor or the instructor was someone who, you know, is sort of renowned, I guess. I mean, maybe not, I don't know if he's renowned, but he, he's done work for Annie Leibovitz. Uh, I think he produced her whole book purely out of the dark room, wow. which is pretty amazing. So when you were first going out and shooting around New York, the first time you picked up a camera, were you already shooting film or were you playing around? Uh, no. So, I mean, I started with my iPhone, mm -hmm. obviously. You know, I started off with that. I didn't have any great photo, I mean, uh, cameras. Maybe a really cheap, uh, compact Canon that I thought was like the best camera ever. Right. But I never really used that because we already had the whole like iPhone thing. But yeah, I was shooting digital. I got into it. My first camera was actually a uh, Canon Mark III. Mm. Uh, which is, I guess, a pretty good camera. Yeah. I still use it. Yeah. So, and I shoot it with doing, like, free freelance work, commercial work. But my two friends who are wedding photographers who actually, you know, I never really, like, formally gave them credit for it, but they gave me confidence to pursue photography because, you know, if your peers are able to do it, you, you always kind of want to emulate and kind of reach for that. You know, it makes, it makes a goal more reachable. Right. But as far as film, I... I got into film, I mean, purely out of curiosity. I don't know. It, I think I think everyone gets into. I don't, well, I can't speak for everyone, but I think a majority of people get into it because they feel like it's another level, which I really don't think it is. <laughs> <laughs> now that I've shoot it a lot, right? But yeah, now now I almost ninety nine percent of my work, well, my personal work is all film, and all my commercial work is digital. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Was your first experience with the darkroom then at ICP? No. 
my first experience with the dark room well i took it baby steps i mean everything i learned was through youtube mm. um not that i think school is bad it is expensive so right. youtube is a really great way to teach yourself things for sure and it's just like hours of learning reading experimenting but i, I mean i didn't jump into the dark room right away i i learned to develop my film first you know obviously wasting a couple of rows first right <laughs> and you know it came out the way i liked and i slowly got really like hooked onto it you know the whole process of shooting i used to scan my film i eat well i used to send my film out to get scanned which got really expensive mm -hmm. and then i bought my own scanner so i started scanning my own film that didn't feel organic to me so i decided to learn how to print my own photos you know in the most traditional authentic way of photography i feel i was given the opportunity to move into the studio my friend owns a office space here and he's i mean i'm gracious enough to like be here and have a little bathroom that which i convert into a dark room amazing and really spent a lot of hours and paper money right. <laughs> <laughs> experimenting and eventually you know i got to a point where I, I think i've found something that's a little bit more consistent but it's always it's always something that you know you could get better at and you know it's it's always something that's magical about it right i mean your your style is is so unique and it it obviously is very much yours was that something that you consciously cultivated or found i don't i don't i don't think i consciously cultivated cultivated it i think it well i'm i'm only beginning to really understand what my style is now mm. you know how can i say it is i don't think it's a style per se like maybe aesthetically there is a common theme or a common um uh, look to it but i always believe that photography is like you know photography is a language right you know people have ways of saying things with words you know there's poets, there's storytellers, there's uh, script writers, there's, you know, the list goes on. But sometimes words can be limiting. And I just feel that photography is one of those mediums where you are able to convey a certain feeling, a certain emotion that you can't convey in any other way. So that's what I'm chasing. It's a, it's a very magical medium. And when I get to an image that I feel that's mine, my own way, and and I feel that it speaks to me in a certain level outside of just like the like the uh, the aesthetics of it. Mm -hmm. That's when I feel like I've accomplished something in my photography. But I I don't think I've consciously cultivated the aspect of that. I've consciously tried to teach myself or experience things that can build onto my art. You know what I mean? Like I'm teaching myself art history now, reading more about the way artists, my favorite artists would think. Why why certain, you know, periods of the art history would change from this to that, to this to that. Uh, and really trying to get into the minds of like these great thinkers of our time or even before our time and see how they really like shifted the way the whole world would respond to art. Right. I'm not saying that I'm trying to change photography in any way. I think that's way beyond my years. <laughs> but I mean, it's certainly a goal that to really try. But yeah, I yeah. don't. I don't think I ever cultivate like consciously really try to like look for a certain look. Yeah. Are there any concepts from art history or any other sort of school of philosophy that you've taken on board that you really resonated with? Man, I take so many different things, and I think it's almost like a slap to the face of people who went to schools to study art. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I've really literally just started reading about it like maybe couple of months and people has been studying it for their whole lives right i mean like i can't really speak in a sense like a very knowledgeable sense but some of my favorite artists you know they come from the abstract expressionism movement where they really rebelled against the whole you know realism uh, form of art the french style form of art mm -hmm. where you know you're painting a mountain exactly as you see it and exactly how it's you know you or maybe not even exactly how you see it, but, you know, the picture is a mountain. Right. Whereas the, the artists that I really admire are the guys who are, you know, are dreamers or guys or gals are dreamers. They really, you know, they see, for example, Ellsworth Kelly. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, no, but he, he's, his work is phenomenal. A lot of my work, now that I look at my work a lot more, 
I think there's aspects of it that I find that I've found inspiration from self-consciously or unconsciously. A lot of his work is based on everyday normal uh, objects, very shadow uh, shaping oriented, very uh, color oriented, um, and it's very much based on shape. If you look at his work, it's very abstract, but he did, I mean, one of the great books that came out, I think, not recently, but it came out, I don't even know the, what, what the first edition came out by, but he had a, he used to take a Leica and he'll take pictures of what he'll like go back to his, his uh, studio and draw, wow. or paint rather. And you'll see exactly the shapes of his 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 paintings, but you know it's in the the thing, right? You know, like if, for example, a barn door with a really like a white barn door, and a black roof, and he'll go back in the studio and abstract it in a way that it's there, but you really gotta like see, right. not just look. You gotta see, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it seems like your work heads a little bit more towards the abstraction and surrealist, or even reductive, or you know, heavy graphic statements. When you are going out to shoot, do you have an idea of what you want in mind, or are you finding it out in the in the world? It's a it's actually a pretty like interesting question because I think depending on like for example on in my work in Reveries, my 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 first book uh, in China, my first actual major major project, I would say. I didn't have an agenda. I mean, I, I went to China because, one, my parents are from there. I'm, I'm actually born in New York. And the city that we visited, uh, Guangzhou, mm -hmm. or Canton, which is literally like a boat ride away from Hong Kong. They're very, like, I mean, they're the same people. The reason why I went back is, one, to visit family. I haven't visited in, like, 25 years. I haven't been there since I was nine years old. Oh, wow. Nine years old? Eight years old. Whatever. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm 33 now, so something like that. That's one. Two, uh, I was attracted by the news of the changes happening in China. The changes happening in China, the cultural changes, the you know the money that's coming into it. You know, the whole reason why a lot of families left China in the first place. I was really interested in that. And I wanted to see firsthand, see my own eyes, you know, and really feel like what's going on before everything is gone. Right. I wanted to do that before. Um, you know, I don't have a chance to. But the, as far as planning my shoot, I didn't plan anything outside of just experiencing it. I didn't have the same luxury I have now where I could go out and shoot and bring it back to the studio, lay it out on the floor and or the wall and look at what I have. I just, you know, I brought my, my, my film. I shot my row, hopefully having some kind of conscious memory of something I shot. And mm -hmm. well, hopefully the film is okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, you know, I, I was there for a month and I shot whatever I shot and you know, cross my fingers, hopefully something came out. And a book came out, I guess. It's <laughs> <laughs> a pretty good but result. Now I'm working on another project in New York, which I have the luxury of, and it's a very different process, right? Now, I, I mean, I approach it the same way. I lived in New York all my life. I have, I think I have a pretty good understand. Well, I mean, I think everyone has their own pretty good understanding of New York. I don't think New York belongs to anyone, mm -hmm. but everyone has their own feel of their own New York. Right. But my New York is, I think it's a very unique one. But saying that, I, 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 well, one, I know how cliche a New York book is. So I had to be really careful of that. So I had to be super critical of my, what I'm shooting, super critical of what I'm getting, which brings me to the second point. I have the luxury of bringing my work here and really studying and seeing what kind of direction I could take and what kind of uh, message or even like feeling or, you know, I'm not really much of a storyteller, I don't think. Uh, but yeah, what kind of direction I can really take this work? Uh, so I mean, to answer your question, I don't think I really consciously think about it until I have to consciously think about because I think I really shoot with instinct. Mm. When I head out on the street, I I I literally just have my camera. Sometimes I have sometimes I have music on, sometimes I don't, and I just find a neighborhood that I just want to go visit, and I'll literally walk all day straight line. Or I let I let my nose like lead me. If I, something interests me, I follow it. I follow my gut. Yeah. If I see nothing, then I see nothing. But right. you know, it's always a straight line. It's always following a uh, intuition. Very cool. For example, on the uh, on your first book, Reveries, which which just came out, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, 
for those who uh, bought a copy, sorry for the delay. <laughs> <laughs> if you bought one, you know, you know how long that delay is. But so, uh, it's out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. We'll definitely put a link in the notes for that. When you finally got all those pictures back and you started to edit, did you have an edit in mind or rules for the edit or guidelines? No, no. When I got back to the studio, I mean, it was such a hectic year, actually. I did a lot of travel last year. So I got back. I had a month in New York. I developed, the first thing I did was develop the film, made my contact sheets, and I didn't really get a chance to really like print. I mean, so my, my process is really make my contact sheets, make some some selections of something that might interest me. I'm not like building a book yet, right. but you know, the pictures that I like, right? Uh, purely out of just, just maybe something that stuck with me from when I shot. And usually when I shoot, I have a pretty good sense of what I like, because I'm not the type of shooter to like shoot off 10 rows in a day. Mm -hmm. I might even do 10 rows in like four months. Wow, wow. <laughs> Literally. I, I, I could like, I still have a row in my, my, well, actually I finished it. I actually just developed it, but I had that row in my camera for maybe a month. No kidding. Yeah, I'm, I'm not that kind of shooter. I'm very, I'm very, I'm very, uh, I don't even know how you call it. I'm probably conscious, conscious. I don't know. So, I mean, that's that's fascinating, though. So what what makes you decide to press the shutter? Gut. Gut, yeah. It's gut feeling. I, I, I don't know. I, I think, well, one, it has to be aesthetically pleasing to my eye first, right? And sometimes it's, and I had to, like, come go, come back to um, my inspirations and in, as far as the arts that I admire. I admire so many, like, different forms of art. And I think, again, like, looking at the work that I've have produced in my little short year, yeah, I just notice like a pattern and I say, oh, wow, I see that. I see that in a, a Wong Kar Wai movie. Uh, are you familiar with his oh, work? Oh, yeah. God, I love his work. Yeah. In Mood for Love. Oh, my God. Man, yeah. that, that movie is... I have that on every single one of my uh, devices as I, well as, Yeah. The, I mean, when I was shooting Reveries, that was the soundtrack I was listening to on oh, loop. Amazing. The, I mean... Yeah, he is an absolute genius, God. <laughs> Chris, Christopher Doyle, right? Yeah. The cinematographer. I mean, like, you know, when a lot of my work, like, for example, that the hand on the rail... Or even like something like that in the back, a little shadow and sharp beam of light. That's just like, it doesn't really say anything, but it says so much because it's a mood that Wong Kar Wai is trying to, you know, provoke. It's not like a lot of the scenes is just like no dialogue, right? Right. But there's so much conversation going on between the actress and the actor. Right. And it's just amazing. I, I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about it. Yeah, for sure. It makes me want to go home and watch it right yeah, now. Yeah, everyone should watch In the Mood for Love. It is a masterpiece, yeah. for sure. Um, the scene of, of uh, there's a man and a woman. You should just go watch it. But there's a scene of a man and a woman going repeatedly back to the same noodle shop that is just... And then and the, and the, and the, 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 the music on the background. Yeah, dun, dun, it's just dun, so good. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so, I mean, that's impressive, though, that you <laughs> you shoot so little... But get so much. I mean, that's, that's well, really cool. I don't, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, I can't tell anyone how they should shoot. Everyone shoots their own way. I just don't, I just know, well, I don't know. I mean, I can't say that I know what exactly I want, but I know exactly what I do not want. Right. And I, I actually learned recently, I've been very, I've restricted myself a lot in the past, but now, now that I'm out trying to work on this project, I want to get into new territories that, you know, that I don't want to question while I shoot. So it's even more instinctual. So if I feel anything at all, or if it it's quirky in any way that makes me like smile, I'll shoot it. Right. And I'll look at it later and analyze it later. If it works, it doesn't. I'll make that decision later. I didn't, you know, maybe a year ago, even during the China project, I, I really, you know, I, I, I wasn't searching for something, but I definitely kind of restricted myself in a in a, some sort of way, but now you know I'm able to <laughs> go through a whole row. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, do you shoot differently when you're shooting digital? Well, I guess it's different parameters, really. Because, yeah. Well, yeah. when I shoot digital, I'm usually working for someone. Actually, yeah. So I got to fill those. Uh, usually a shot list or right. Their the objective or I mean most of my clients are I pretty much have a lot of freedom of doing. I mean, obviously, there's some kind of parameters. Right. And you're trying to sell something. Right? something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, like the, the liberty of shooting digital is that you get to look in the back end. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's liberty and it's also, you know, detriment to your own work. But, right. you know, you you get to like shoot a thousand frames and not have to worry about 
buying another role. Right. A thousand frames is a lot of money in film. <laughs> <laughs> that it is. Amazing. But now I, I definitely have a clear direction of what I want to get to. Uh, but it's all working towards that direction. And what is that? Man, you put me in a corner, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I, really like to, I really like to explore the, the art of making photo books the next the next the next project i'm working on new york i think i'm gonna work on more of not not only just the photography part like reveries i think it's a book where yes it's a it's a, i sequenced it i spent a lot of time editing the sequence um even though you know where i'm very sparse in the amount of images in the book i think every image has packed information and they speak to each other in some sort of way yeah and it's it's a totally different project where i'm doing in new york now whereas it's the construction of the book, well, maybe not construction, maybe the, even the, se- the sequence and hopefully the construction. I mean, I haven't got to that point. I'm thinking like way ahead. Really plays into the message of what I'm trying to. So it's not just about the pictures now. It's about like you have to get the book to understand what I want to do with this project. Right. Uh, whereas Reveries, yes, it, 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 yes, it's a sequence. You know, the, the beauty of photo books is that the pages are always going always to be in the same order. Whereas like exhibitions, you can have only have one print hanging and the rest is gone. And you're just like, no context. Right. What, what is your thought process when you're sequencing images? I mean, it depends. It depends on what your, the thought process of your project, mm-hmm. right? I think you can't, you can't pigeonhole yourself or put yourself in a box and like, okay, this is what it is. Right. Like this is the format I'm going to stay the rest of my life, right? No. I think that's the wrong way of approaching anything, right? Yeah. And the same same thing with like the whole film and digital debate. It's just a never ending debate and you should never pigeonhole yourself in a way that blocks your creativity. Right. I mean I only made one book, so I can only talk about one book, right? <laughs> so the book is Reveries and the reason why it's named Reveries, it's I mean it's 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 a lot of things connecting together and that's why I I had to go with this specific title. It's the feel of China, right? The the reason why I went to China is because of the changes. Because I, you know, I'm like, I have this connection to to uh, this specific city. I'm Cantonese. My family's Cantonese, but I'm American, so I have a very like outsider kind of perspective. Uh, no matter what I do, if I'm going back to the city, I'm always this outsider. Right. Right. So seeing in my eyes and seeing the changes that's happening. And kind of just understanding in my own way. I don't think my work is representative of what reality is. Mm -hmm. It's really a representative of my perception and reality of what I can build from what I already know. But the changes I saw happening there, I saw happening exactly in where I'm living now in the Lower East Side in Manhattan. Right. But it's happening there now, and it's been happening in Lower East Side for the past 20 years, ever since I was born there. Yeah. When, when you were out on the street shooting uh, in China, did you have any resistance from people on the street? Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not the type of, I'm not like a Bruce Gilden type of photographer right. where I'm, I have a flash and a, like a sh- two, two centimeters from your nose. <laughs> oh, right. Like, I don't, you don't want to do that in New York. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, he did in New York. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's a, you know, he's a, Tough looking guys. <laughs> I'm not that tough looking. So, no, I, I I I prefer to shoot from a distance. Not because, well, maybe partly because I'm I don't have that confidence to approach people like that, but more so because I observe, I observe. I do it in a very observatory way. Like I, I read the situation, right? Again, yeah. it's all about my perception and it's all about like what's going on and what I can build out of that, right? Right. And not exactly what's happening at that moment. So if I was to get, you know, every time you put a camera in front of someone's face, I mean, same with this mic, your whole personality changes. All right. So that's the last thing I want to do in a photograph. I want to preserve that essence as much as I can, whatever I'm photographing. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why I would shoot with a longer lens. I also shoot with a 50 mil, which you know, would require me to move in a little closer, but that's okay sometimes. Mm -hmm. But that's how I prefer to approach my photographs. Yeah, I like that. It's a, it's participating, but not in a, in in a direct way. Yeah, I think I'm introverted by nature. So like, whatever I'm looking at, it's always about like what I think it is. And instead of like me reading the facts. Yeah, I love that idea. Right. Not, not, not like, not like actually reading the facts, but like looking at a situation for what it is. I always like try to 
make up my own situation in my head. Right, completely. <laughs> I, no, I think I think that's a more interesting way to look at it than just taking the photo for what it is. I sure. think so. No, I mean, I, lo- I love that thought process. That's really cool. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So when you were putting Reveries together, at what point did you realize you had a cohesive body of work and what, what were those signifiers that it was working? Well, this is my first project editing. So, I mean, it, it, it's all just an experiment, right? I mean, I th- think I got to a point where I'm really happy about what I have. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm, I, man, I could edit something you know, to the depth of it. but <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a set amount of photos in mind? Sort of. So when I came back, I you know I only sh- I, don't, I don't know the exact amount of rows, but it can't be more than twenty rows that I shot. Wow, maybe fifteen, maybe even less. <laughs> I before I had a meeting, um, I just told this guy that I shot. He asked the same question. He's like, "Oh, so how many how many rows do you shoot in China?" I'm like, "Oh, well, I shot maybe fifteen. And it's funny because and then I I showed him my darkroom and I showed him because we were talking about like sending work or sending rows to get developed in the lab. And I was telling them how they always like fog my film or like something wrong goes, and that's why I got into the whole like developing myself and mm-hmm. doing everything myself because wow. I just wasn't happy with people messing up my work. For sure. <laughs> but I showed them like like this uh, light leak going into my one of my one of the photographs that I really like, but unfortunately it just doesn't have the same kind of like depth because of like the light leak. Mm-hmm. And I was telling him how, like, yeah, man, I, I had maybe 20 rows that I brought to China, and I probably shot, like, 12 or 15, and I had five more rows. But that year, I went traveling a lot after China. I went to the Philippines, and then I went to Burma, and then I went to Hawaii, to Canada. So all these places, all the, like, I brought those rows around, so I've been traveling around with me. So, like, <laughs> those rows ended up being, like, fogged up itself. Right, right. <laughs> I shot maybe 12 rows and sequencing it, I wanted to, most of the books that I come across that I really like, uh, well, one, I didn't want to make a big book. Mm -hmm. I never really liked big photo books because you don't, you tend to like really just flip the road like a magazine. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I have some in my my, uh, cabinet, but it's like, I never ever finished those books. Unless it's like a... Like a Vivian Meyer, like, right. like she has like phenomenal work, and you want to look at every one, but yeah. like it's just a, too much of a commitment for someone to look through a book. And I wanted to make a book that each photograph has some kind of, you know, narrative, maybe not narrative, but it has its its place in the book, right? Right, and it forces you to really pay attention and try to make your own opinions, because I don't think I, it's up to me to dictate anything trying to make your own opinions and for me to put like a book that's 70 pages long it's I don't think that's feasible at all um, but I most of my favorite books are around 40 images 50 images at the time I was working I was an assistant to uh, this Italian ph- photographer who helped me edit uh, the first batch I brought maybe 60 images to a studio and he just like you know David you should edit it down to 25 I'm like what? <laughs> uh, and that, and she's like, well, why don't you help me out? <laughs> like down to 25. And it, it's always easier for someone else to edit your work. Sure. Because, you know, they don't have that physical or that emotional attachment to uh, what you shot. Uh, so he just plucked it out like it was like nothing. Like, <laughs> Wow, yeah. Well, he, he, he took out like maybe, he, he edited it down to maybe like 30 something. And, you know, I, I took his advice. Really, I tried to like, and he, he went through every single one. He's like, oh, this makes sense here. This makes sense here. And at that point, I still didn't have a direction. I didn't have the name of the title. And I didn't have anything, right? I just had the images. And I also saw what he was doing. What Actually, what he did was really helpful because now it just, like, what, what he took out, just, like, kind of, he kind of, like, put everything, like, the work was very cohesive. Like, it's very, like, my, my work is, all my, all the things I shoot is mostly very similar in aesthetics but like he really nailed down like what it looks to have like a cohesive body of work mm. and I think I would eventually I got to that but he did it in like 15 minutes wow. so can you can you verbalize what some of those elements were or is um, it just, it's more just look at the work check it out <laughs> I mean I think I think it's pretty apparent I mean I, I I have a lot of lines in my work specifically in the book i mean i think in, overall in my work i have a lot of lines i don't i don't really know why mm-hmm. 
maybe it's purely aesthetics maybe it's just my ocd kind of <laughs> way of looking at things <laughs> of organizing reality <laughs> yeah um i have a lot of uh gestures and i think i mean now that i think about the lines i mean when i was putting together i mean not that now that i think about the lines but when i was putting together the book the lines has a significance because it could signif signify two things it could signify going up you know mm -hmm. or going down right and the whole the whole premises of reveries is just about to change right but everyone sees change in their own way right right like before me going before going to china i looked at the change going to china like it's a like the best thing that could happen yeah yeah of course it, it's a good thing that's happening but on the other side of things you're losing culture you're losing well a very very heavy history of culture you're losing buildings that they used to have you know they're they're replacing it with skyscrapers a uh, very you know urban metropolis type right like it's even like buildings even like more futuristic than new york yeah and you're losing these like really like cool like artifacts all right right but you know there's two sides of the stories of things so i think the lines have a very significant it's a very significant theme in my book but yeah he he really like nailed it down i mean there's some shots in, that i edited out and i haven't shown anyone that's like maybe more 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 of a representative picture of like a street photography or photo photo journalism type thing that i th thought it was cool but it would not fit in a book mm. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had any offers or inclination to show your work in a gallery show? No, if you have one, please. <laughs> yeah. I mean, are you adverse to gallery stuff or would you? Would no, you do no. Um, well, I've, I've only begun sending my books out uh, again. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, I'm, I intend to send it out to uh, not galleries, but, you know, people, well, one, people who are admired, who inspired me in the beginning of my journey. And inspired me now is not to say they have to be in the photo industry. I want to send it to like photo editors and really like see their opinion. Yeah. You know, um, it's all about growth to me. Yeah, for sure. Know? So having started taking Instagram photos on your iPhone and moving into film black and white, what is your relationship with Instagram or social media? Do you still enjoy it or participate? Oh yeah, I love Instagram. Yeah. I don't particularly show my work the way I used to. I used to uh, I used to do the whole scanning thing, cleaning it up and uh, putting it as a JPEG. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I would say I don't even use my scanner anymore. I mean, when I use the scanner, I would scan the print to like, if I had to like send it to like a article or something like that, or if I want to send it to a, like a contest or what whatnot. Right. But I I mean I like I like the fact that well one you get to meet people like you, like this this would never happen. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, I met really amazing people through Instagram. Um, you get access to photography, to, I mean, art and photography throughout the world that you'll, you can't get access to unless you buy a ticket. Right. <laughs> or have, like, maybe even some kind of connection to. I mean, it just opens so many avenues. But at the same time, I, I'm also very aware that, you know, the way you show, the way I show my work, you know, the way I show my work on Instagram, I had to be careful with because what I do is very different from just purely a JPEG perspective, I think. Right. And I, I also think, I mean, yeah, maybe I shouldn't say this, but <laughs> I also think like I don't really have, I don't really have a lot of work to show for. <laughs> right. So if I show it all, then like what, what else is there to show? <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, but I mean, on, on a serious note, I, I think Instagram is a great tool. Yeah. I, I, ma I made so many relationships. If I do show a picture, I'll, I'll usually take a picture of my prints because uh, I think, I, I mean, I spend a lot of time on making my prints, uh, making sure that it's up to my standards, that I think it's just not fair for it, mm -hmm. the print, to be put into a scanning machine then maybe cleaned out in Photoshop <laughs> right, completely and stuff. I mean, I do that occasionally, but yeah. I don't, you know, that's, that's my form of way of like sharing my work now, just like really like work in progress type, yeah. type of photographs or like, you know, updates of what's going on with my work. Right. Just to dig into your process a little bit, do you, do you have a favorite, you know, setup or film stock or anything like that? Uh, I primarily shoot Tri-X for film stock just because it's easily available. And also I'm just used to it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 
Do you I'm, push pull or play around with anything like that? I usually overexpose a stop, but I don't. I guess I do push it a bit in development. I mean, I mean, everyone has like their own like little like way of develop. I mean, I'm not. It's not a secret for me. It's just. It's just like, I don't know. It's not. It's not very standard. Yeah, right. I'm sure it's super nuanced when you're in the dark room. Anyway, it's more of a feeling, right? At some point. Well, I think I think developing film is more like once you get. I mean, well, it's different for every every way you expose your film. Right. If you're shooting on like a flat day like today, you want to add. If you want to add more contrast, you'll do something to like the agitation or use a different kind of develop. Like there's different ways of doing that. Do you, or if it's like a sunny day where it's like you get these sharp shadows, which I like, but sometimes I want to retain some of that detail. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll like maybe I'll try to agitate less, or even just like you know sometimes the the, the highlights would blow out and I would just leave it in the developer a little longer to let that develop. I mean it's all it's all in the technical aspect of the darkroom. Right. You've, I'm not I'm it, not a master in the darkroom by any means, so <laughs> <laughs> it's all experimenting and reading a lot. Right. And what works for me now works for me, and you know. I bet there's a lot of people out there who are probably like, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it shows on the print that you probably do. <laughs> do you have a daily photo practice? Do you shoot every day? No, I don't shoot every day. As evidence of my, my 10 frames uh, per photo <laughs> walk or five. <laughs> <laughs> but are you probably always, are you I'm very, in the very room, much, or? very, very much involved with uh, everything photo related, every single breathing moment of my life. Yeah. Do you always have a camera on you? Well, yeah, I have an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't always carry my camera around with me because because I don't I don't record moments. Do you know? Right. I know I'm not like a photojournalist. I'm not a. I mean, at least I don't think I am. Mm -hmm. I don't document, and when I shoot, I have to intentionally feel like I want to shoot. There are times where I miss shots that I don't have my cameras on me, and usually when I shoot, I'll carry two of my my bodies, mm -hmm. and I'm just like shit you messed up <laughs> but those are the days where it's like well you know whatever right right you can't win all the battles right i just take an iphone shot <laughs> exactly. exactly um but yeah i don't carry my camera all the time but my 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 photo practice and terms of photo is all i mean again it goes back to like it's not about i mean i'm always in the state of curiosity and just nurturing that curiosity like just teach myself new things yeah. Whatever my nose or whatever my mind wants to learn, I'll, you know, dive deep into it and try to like upset. I'm very much obsessed. I'm a very obsessive person. Right now, actually, I'm very, very much into the whole alternative practice of the dark room. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many different ways of doing it, and it's just amazing what the level of work that's coming out of the that kind of world. Yeah. Uh, cameraless, playing with chemicals. You know, not, 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 not working in a dark room in a textbook kind of way like that that type of work really intrigues me because now it's all now now it's not about what you're taught it's about what you want to do right and what you feel is interesting and if it's a failure it's a failure but at the end of the day if you do something that you're interested in uh eventually it'll lead you to something that is uh i think i mean i don't know Maybe it'll just lead you to more failure, but I think it'll lead you to something more interesting and your work will be enriched with more depth. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. I've only been in the darkroom early on when I was a student, but I mean, there was something very meditative for me about it, just alone working this process and yeah, yeah. kind of finding it. Yeah, the darkroom is a very, uh, it's a place to really meditate and really study your own work. Especially, think, especially if you do I meditate? No, I don't meditate. No, no I was gonna. No, that, I was gonna say, do you do you see yourself just sticking with a darkroom practice moving forward? Again, I don't like to pigeonhole myself. Right. But I love I love the darkroom. I mean, I've only had this darkroom for a year, maybe a little bit more than a year. But when I get when I get there, I'm always, man, I'll be there for ten hours. Wow. It's probably not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the day, my brain is fried. My legs are tired. My my uh, my respiratory system is probably shot, <laughs> but like yeah, man, you you come out you come out there you work you work on something new you work on something that you want to work on that's old, you always come out there learning new things about yourself and your own work. It's always a treat to, it's either a treat or or it's a you know you're nourishing what you want to work on. Right, 
Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. And I don't think there's any other way you could, I mean, there. Are, I mean, again, I'm speaking for myself. There's no other way for me to do it. Again, I've done the digital thing. I, could, I can't, for the life of me, Photoshop anything. Uh, and it's just not enjoyable for me. Like, at least in the dark room, yeah, it's expensive. But even on the mess, messed up prints or, like, stuff that I don't like, sometimes I get, like, happy accidents. And I want to show you when I get into the dark room that it's like, there's, a, there's this thing that happened. Actually, in the beginning of my darkroom uh, experimental phases, something that happened to a piece of paper, and it turned out looking like like Saturn. Wow! Like it's nothing, but it's just chemistry, paper, and just a lot of messing up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you learn a lot of new things. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Well, thank you, David. I really appreciate you doing this, and uh, yeah. I look forward to savoring your book and. Uh, Looking forward to your next New York project as well. Well, thank you for coming by. Thank you for bringing the beers. Of course. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, David.